Hello, my name is Mark Lacey, and it's my great joy to serve the Lord as the lead pastor here at Lifehouse Church. Thank you for tuning in and taking advantage of this resource. It's our sincere prayer that this resource is a blessing to you and that it encourages your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. At the same time, I want to express our conviction that this resource not be used at the expense of your being connected to and a participating member of a local church family. Our church family gathers every Sunday with services at 9 and 11 a.m. And we would love for you to be a part of all that God is doing in and among us here.
praise God for that love that is unending, right? Just an ocean of love that's ready for you this morning. If you've never before received Christ, man, today's the day of salvation, all right? Don't be, don't hold anything back this morning. God has you here for a reason, and we're looking forward to what he's going to do uh, through his people today. Family, it's good to see you at the table. We're sitting down, we're eating. Actually, we're standing up and we're rejoicing, right? But we're going we're gonna to come to the Lord's table this morning and just to partake and to eat in what he has for us today. My name is Rob. I'm the worship pastor here at Lifehouse. If this is your very first time, guys, we welcome you. So glad you're here, and I hope you feel welcome. I hope you have stopped by our new here table. We have a free gift for you and your family. Any questions you may have, ask any of us here, any of us with, with a tag on this morning. We'd love to, to answer those questions for you, but we're glad you are here. Folks, let's, let's welcome our first time guests. All right. So glad you guys are here. You know, and one of the things uh, we believe here at Lifehouse Church is the Bible, right? We believe all of the Bible, not parts of the Bible, all of the Bible. And in his holy word, he talks about adoration and lifting him up and responding to what he's done for us. And so we want to do that this morning. We want to respond in prayers of adoration. And that's just fancy word for telling God who he is. Sometimes, I don't know about you, I get a little self focused. I get a little um, Rob oriented and, uh, and my day is not the greatest. It's, in fact, it's stinky because I've taken my focus off of Christ. But when I do come back in and adore him for what he has done in my life and just to thank him for who he is, man, there's, there's a heart change that happens. And so this morning is not about us, even though you may feel tired this morning. Man, you may be on a mountaintop. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> no. But man, a lot, of those, a lot of us who live in this world, this dark, wicked world, man, it's, it's hard to go against that current, that strong current, man. It's rushing at us 24 seven, but let's just pause, not take time to say hello to anybody right now, but let's just adore Christ. Find two or three people that you trust around you and let's out loud, let's just pray our prayers of adoration. All right, church, let's go, let's worship, let's adore him.
Your name is great and greatly to be praised. So your name is great and greatly to be praised. regardless of our circumstance. God, you are worthy, you are holy, you are powerful, you are good. Everlasting Father, our closest friend, God, we love you. And worthy you were, and worthy you are, and worthy you will be forever, Yahweh. Worthy you were, and worthy you are, and worthy Is great 
and greatly to be praised and worthy you were and worthy you are and worthy you will be forever Yahweh The joy that's found in you alone, I claim. 
Father, we love you. We praise you, the living God of Israel. Lord, you are here with us. The God who sees you are um, next to us, Lord. And we trust you. We walk through uh, valleys with you, walk up mountains with you, God. You are always there. You are always present. Right now, Lord, continue. Give us worship. Give us hearts of, of posture, of leaning on you, trusting in you in the name of Jesus. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Joel Miller here. All right. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to worship through giving. Hey, everybody, Joel Miller. Hey, guys, good morning. So Ravi was actually having the chance to talk to Team Kid uh, this morning and just share about a little bit about what he's doing, so we apologize for being a little late, but I'm Pastor Joel. I'm blessed to serve as the missions and outreach pastor here, and we're going to worship through giving. And uh, you can see on the screen behind me, there's a number of ways to do that. Uh, in a few moments, the ushers will come forward uh, with the baskets. But we're blessed to have a missionary from India today, Ravi Lang, and uh, he serves in India. We've partnered with him numerous ways in the past to build water wells and get clean water to people there, to get Bibles uh, to those who don't have access to Bibles in their native language, and also to, uh, to help fund a, a training center called Lighthouse uh, training center to train pastors and missionaries to go throughout South Asia and to reach the, the unreached. So I just want to welcome him to come up uh, and share quickly about uh, that project. Hey guys, good morning. It is an honor and privilege to be with you this morning. And yesterday we had a phenomenal time uh, just talking about gospel and evangelism and how we can reach people here and globally. And um, I represent a part of the world, India, where some of the most unreached and unengaged people groups live and about 75% of all the unreached peoples that exist, they live in that South Asia region. So our vision and mission is called Reach South Asia. And I really wanna thank you for praying for us, for supporting some of our initiatives, persecution is rising over there. And it was a really joy and a privilege to meet with the leadership here who've invested in uh, protecting children who can become prone to human trafficking and supporting some of the initiatives where we are equipping pastors to have healthy theology so that they can be launched to plant healthy churches. And one of the initiatives that we're working towards now is called Lighthouse Delhi. And it is, you know, phenomenal to be here with you this morning at Lighthouse Delaware. Uh, so I bring you greetings from Lighthouse Delhi. And this place will facilitate learning of good theology and allow will allow us to mobilize gospel amongst unreached people groups in South Asia. So thank you for supporting Lighthouse Delhi. Thank you for sending Bibles. Thank you for um, protecting children in the name of Jesus. And thank you for being a part of reaching the unreached through Reach South Asia. God bless. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Ravi. And uh, church, it's because of your generosity that we're able to support missionaries like Ravi uh, and others around the world so that we can reach people in all places 
with the gospel. It's because of your generosity that we're able to do that. I just want to uh, quickly mention, Ravi will be in the lobby by the missions table uh, after the service. So please take a moment to come and introduce yourself to him and say hello uh, and sign up for his newsletter. He'd love to connect with you. But thank you, church, for your generosity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for the most generous gift that you have displayed to us by sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, I thank you that you invite us into this, uh, uh, this, this ministry of reconciliation by allowing us to be your ambassadors, to take the gospel to the ends of the earth and to, to proclaim the good news of what your son has done for us. So Lord, I pray that you would uh, continue to grow us to be generous so that we might reach all people in all places with the good news. And it's in your name we pray, amen.
of that we praise you and we respond right now god would you speak through your messenger speak through your word your holy word god we love you god we want you to get all glory today open up hearts today speak loudly and we surrender to your will today in jesus name amen amen please remain standing and turn in your bibles to matthew chapter 15 as we continue our verse by verse journey through this incredible graciously given word of god Starting in verse 1, Matthew chapter 15. We're told that then the Pharisees and the scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem. They didn't really come simply to him. They came at him when they came to him. And they said, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. Jesus answered them, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and mother. And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. It's a capital offense. But you, scribes and Pharisees, say, if anyone tells his father or his mother what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And Jesus then called the people to him and said to them, hear and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to Jesus, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard the saying? Jesus answered, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them, the scribes and Pharisees alone, they are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, lead the blind both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to Jesus, explain the parable to us. And Jesus said, Peter, are you still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. Oh, Lord, would you bless the reading of your holy word. Amen. Please be seated. So just to give you a heads up, I know some of you will struggle with this if you're like me. So there are three points written in your bulletin outlining what's 
going to be or was supposed to be the sermon this morning. And I gave those points even to multimedia earlier in the week. But as I continued to study this passage, while those points are still points, I think, reflected in the passage, I'm going with a different outline. So just understand and know that they, they won't be listed on the screen for you, but I'll try to list them, the outline of where I feel this passage uh, to communicate the truth even better. First we see, this is the first point, Jesus boldly disputing disingenuous, a disingenuous delegation. And he does so with authority. So in that day, and, and a lot of the people that Matthew was writing to, they thought that the scribes and the Pharisees were the authority, right? They were the establishment, the religious go-to guys. But Jesus is clearly, or excuse me, Matthew is clearly documenting how Jesus authoritatively disputes a disingenuous delegation. The second point is that Jesus then denounces that delegation, I mean, completely, he fully discloses the utter delusion of their doctrine and their definite demise, the definite demise that their false doctrine is leading them to. So again, the second point is Jesus denounces this delegation completely, fully disclosing the utter delusion that their doctrine is leading them to. And then last, we see Jesus diagnoses the true dilemma of man's defilement. So again, Jesus boldly disputing a disingenuous delegation. Secondly, Jesus denounces that delegation completely by fully disclosing the delusion of their doctrine and their definite demise. And last, Jesus diagnoses the true dilemma of man's defilement. Literally, what he's doing, going to do is get to the heart of the matter, which is our heart and not our hands. So again, first, Jesus loved this confrontation. I mean, again, there's this conception in Christendom, at least American Christianity, that Jesus was kind of this peace-loving, hippie, sh shiny shampoo hair model, right, that went around loving on kids and petting lambs, and while he did love on kids, and may he, he maybe petted a lamb or two. This is not what scripture reveals. I mean, Jesus was a man's man. He stood firm. He confronted when confront, confrontation was necessary. And here he boldly stands firm in light of this, what could be to many of us an intimidating delegation. They were disingenuous. Jesus disputes them and he does so with authority. Remember what Jesus says about himself at the end of this gospel, Matthew chapter 28. He says, all authority in heaven and earth have been given to me. Not to the scribes or the Pharisees, right? To him, to Jesus, the son of God. All authority belongs to him. And Jesus disputes this disingenuous delegation. Matthew here specifically is documenting this contentious relationship between Jesus and again, the so-called self-appointed religious leaders of the day. The Pharisees and the scribes. Remember, they were, and we've seen them before. This is not the first time we've seen them. If you've been here on our journey through Matthew's gospel, like, like this is not the first time we've been introduced to these people. They were in error, gross error. They were way off base. I mean, they, they talk about malpractice. I don't know about you. I, I'm not going to say his name, but, but my family used to go to a doctor here in Middletown. And he didn't do any necessarily malpractice worth suing for, but I'm, I'm telling you, we, we realized after time, after all of us had gone several, I mean, my foot could have cut, get, gotten cut off and he would have diagnosed me with a sinus infection. I mean, everything was a sinus infection. I, I mean, these scribes and Pharisees were way off base. We've been journeying through Matthew's gospel and we've seen these scribes and these Pharisees front and center right off the bat. I mean, Matthew chapter three, right before even Jesus begins his earthly ministry, Right, they confronted, they were sent from Jerusalem to confront John the Baptist, right, who was preaching, like prepare the way of the Lord, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and he was encouraging people to repent of their sin. And he called the scribes and the Pharisees to their face, John the Baptist did, you brood of vipers. Jesus in his first sermon, right, even in the intro of his first sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, best sermon ever preached, most famous sermon ever preached, Matthew 5, 20, he declares to the people, the crowds, the multitudes around him, listen, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, you're going to fall short if you keep following them. 
If you keep doing what they tell you to do, don't follow them. And when Jesus finished the sermon, Matthew chapter 7, verse 28, if you remember, the crowds, the multitudes of people, they were literally astonished. It's a strong word. Like their mouths were on the ground at Jesus' teaching, specifically, verse 29, because he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. In other words, he was not teaching what the scribes had been teaching. What Jesus was teaching and preaching did not align with what the scribes and the Pharisees had been teaching, how they've been leading. The scribes, what Jesus is communicating and, and, and gets to in this, uh, this passage is he was, not only were they, were the scribes and Pharisees leading the people of God astray, he was leading them to the pit of hell. Or not Jesus, but the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, Jesus made it clear that he did not come to abolish the law that the scribes and the Pharisees pro- declared to uphold. Right? Jesus said, I've come to fulfill the law, God's law. But the thing is, the law is not the problem. The scribes and the Pharisees' explanation, their application of the law, their commentary on the law, like they took it upon themselves to explain to the people. The problem was they were explaining wrongly. There were all kinds of loopholes and exceptions, and we'll get into that. Jesus addresses that. It's kind of like taxes, right? You guys know April 15th was the deadline. (laughs) Listen, I have an accounting degree, like pre-calling into full-time vocational ministry. I used to be an accountant. I used to do people's taxes, right? And I've been doing my own taxes for years, ever since we've been married. I mean, I have an accounting degree. Accountants should do their own taxes, right? Save some money there. But you get TurboTax, and it's supposed to walk through and make it easy. It is so complicated, There's all kinds of exemptions. There's all kinds of deductions. I mean, you can file merit filing jointly, but you can also file merit filed separately. And you can merit filing jointly for federal purposes and then for state purposes is a different ballgame. And this is kind of the idea when it came to God's law and what the scribes and the Pharisees had to say about it. They were making all kinds of exceptions. Listen, God did not make the exceptions. But these scribes and these Pharisees were were creating all kinds of loopholes in their interpretation. They were making excuses. They were justifying. Over time, the leaders of God's people, these scribes and these Pharisees, the elders, they had become corrupt. So it wasn't an, even an innocent error. Like sometimes with my taxes, I just hope for the best. Like, like worst case scenario, they'll just audit me and I'll have to pay more. But no, they had become corrupt and they gave interpretations and guidelines that benefited them and their pocketbooks. They became also the enforcers, not just the interpreters or the explainers, but the enforcers of their erroneous interpretation of God's law, right? So they became God's police, self-appointed. And in doing so, they missed the heart of what God's law was all about. God's law was given to the people of a me, as a means of glorious revelation, as a means of relationship. But the religious leaders had made it strictly all about religion, right? Impossible systems of rules and rituals that they enforced on the people, regulation after regulation, what God had tended to be a blessing for and to his people, a bridge, if you will, unto himself had been hijacked by his so-called leaders that he so supposedly appointed. And instead of being a blessing, it became a huge burden, much too heavy, in fact, impossible For his people to bear. And so we see in and through the gospels what Jesus, what Matthew documents, and in through the other gospels too, Jesus literally is the perfect and promised bridge. The glorious revelation of God, the means by which men can know and enter into a relationship with Almighty God. The scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they told the people, follow us, do what we tell you to do. But Jesus said, follow me. Right? They promoted their way as a way of righteousness, but Jesus preached, follow me, believe in me, trust in me. Let me be for you what you cannot be for yourself. Let me do for you what no one else or nothing else can do for you, right? Acts 4.12, salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. Jesus did on the cross, accomplished on the cross what man could not do for for himself. And so he is the true bridge. Jesus is our righteousness. And his righteousness far exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, right? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, and this is what the gospels are all about, like that God made him, Jesus, the righteousness of God, 
who knew no sin become sin on our behalf so that we who are not righteous might become the righteousness of God or consider the righteousness of God in him. This is why Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, in light of telling the people, don't follow the scribes, the Pharisees, he says, follow me and come unto me. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Like all you who are spinning your wheels and getting nowhere, all of you who keep trying, doing what the scribes and the Pharisees are telling you to do, trying to bear the burden that the Pharisees and the scribes are laying upon you that was never meant to be laid upon you. Come unto me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Learn from me and find rest for your souls, Jesus said. It was an invitation, an authoritative invitation, a command even. Obviously, the scribes and the Pharisees were threatened by Jesus. Like with Jesus, they would no longer be needed, right? Their power and authority, Jesus was making void. And despite the fact that Jesus' identity is obvious, I mean, Jesus, right, he's healing people, performing miracles, walking on water, as we saw last week. They simply are not going to go down without a fight. Right in Matthew 12, 14, leading up to this passage, we're told that the Pharisees, right after Jesus delivered a man, he healed a man with a withered hand. No doctor could have healed him. Jesus healed him. But the Pharisees, instead of worshiping Jesus like they should have, submitting to and following Jesus, they went out and conspired against Jesus, specifically how to destroy him. Now, they have to be strategic and careful because all the people love the miracles. They see that Jesus is the Messiah, but because Jesus' fame at this point had reached its peak, healing, delivering, preaching with authority, the scribes have to be strategic. And that's the context of this passage. So understand that in verse 1, that's what's motivated the scribes and the Pharisees to come all the way from Jerusalem to where Jesus is at, 60 miles Leading up to this passage, we're told that Jesus is an area known of Gennesaret, which is the north side of Galilee. They came all the way. They didn't have planes, trains, and automobiles, but these guys were on a mission. They walked or maybe rode a donkey or something, a chariot, all the way to Gennesaret, 60 miles. But understand, in seeking Jesus, they're not seeking truth. They're not there to worship him from Jerusalem or to learn from Jesus, the Son of God, clearly the Messiah. They want to destroy him. They're conspiring against him that they might destroy him. And this is next level, right? We've seen the scribes and the Pharisees, but this time they're from HQ, from headquarters, right? They're from home base, like the big dogs from Jerusalem went all the way to Gennesaret. These men, though, are disingenuous. Jesus know, and that's why we know in this confrontation, he begins to preach and teach in parables because he's not going to entrust himself to these guys who are not seeking truth. They don't want to know the truth. That's part of the reason he starts to preach in parables. Learn from the scribes and the Pharisees. Don't be like them. There's many in our day who are seeking to discredit Jesus. Many who come to church, maybe are drugged to church because they want to find fault in something. Just like these scribes and Pharisees were trying to find fault in Jesus. These men are disingenuous. Don't be disingenuous. Listen, the Lord wants to be found. The Lord wants to be seen. He wants to be known. That's why he sent Jesus to make a way for us who are far from him in our sin and sinfulness to know and not just know about, but to know in relationship. In Jeremiah 29, 13, right? God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Way back in Jeremiah 29, 13, told the people of God, listen, if you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you. Like if you're seeking me sincerely, genuinely, you'll find me. His arms are open wide. And I would say the same to you today. If you're here sincerely, genuinely seeking truth, you will find truth. God wants you to know him. God's word reveals who he is. Seek him and you will find. Nevertheless, when these leaders come, they're conniving, conspiring. They're contentious. And they asked Jesus in the presence of all the crowd, hoping to discredit him. Verse 2, why do your disciples break as in transgress sin against the tradition of our elders? Why do they break our traditions? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. They're asking about the disciples, but understand, Jesus is their teacher, is wrapped in, guilty by association. Jesus, why don't you guys, why don't you wash your hands like you're supposed to? And understand their, their question is not about hygiene, right? I know we got a lot of clean freaks in here, a lot of moms who are always making their kids wash their hands. This is not what this is about. This is about religion. This is about ritual. This is about rules. 
and regulations. Listen, in Jesus' day, defilement was a big deal. The Jews viewed themselves as set apart from a defiled world. They viewed themselves as consecrated. And it's hard when you're consecrated to live in a defiled world. You're bound to be defiled. You're bound to be uh, uh, defiled, right? Infected, if you will. Like, like just like when, when COVID was around, like everybody was wondering, like if I touch that person or if that person breathes on me, like Jews literally walked around like that all the time. Like if they walked into the marketplace where, where Gentiles were there, if they touched something that a Gentile had previously touched, they would cons- that would render them defiled. So it was just a matter, like they didn't question, they just considered themselves anytime they went out of their own house as defiled. And their answer or response to that was to cleanse themselves, here translated as wash, again and again and again and over and over and over. And God's law did understand you, address cleansing. God's law did in the Old Testament address consecration in preparation for worship. And their outward cleansing, even in that instance, though, was to be an expression of their need as a people for cleansing, a need for purity, a need for, for, for holiness. But the religious leaders of Jesus' day took what God had said, God's law, and forced traditions that required people to cleanse over and over and over. And not just the priests in preparation for worship, but everybody because of getting defiled over and over by living and interacting in non-Jewish spaces. And it wasn't as even simple. What they enforced was not as simple as washing your hands. Like you might think, like, go to the bathroom and, and wash your hands. No, that they actually specified the minimum amount of water needed to properly wash your hands. And you were supposed to do it in a certain manner. Like you, you had to hold first that pour that minimum amount of water over your hands. And you had to hold your fingertips up lest they be defiled. Like, Again, so the water could run off and the water had to run off, hold them up to the run off the elbow. And then you had to repeat with your fingers pointing down. And then you had to take your fist and rub it in and clean the inside. I mean, this was this whole very specific uh, explanation of what the people had to do, not just before a meal, but also after a meal. And if you were a really good Jew, you did it even in between the different courses. This was a burden, And this was all just oral tradition, like the commentary. This was the scribes and the Pharisees saying, just to to, to know what God wants, he wants you to do all these things, but this is not what God wanted. Now in 200 AD, this was the oral law at the time, but it actually was written down in what's called the Mishnah. Scribes and the Pharisees said, if you want to be said, if you want to be consecrated and set apart, not defiled, you have to wash your hands this way. They were very superstitious. Some of them believed that actually when you were sleeping, a demon would land on your hand. And if you didn't wash your hand, you you ate the food, the demon would thereby, you'd be possessed. The demon was called Shibna. They believed that they were very superstitious and believed that you can't worship God if you're defiled specifically by not washing your hands. Now the truth is God is holy. Right, the Bible, not just holy, he is holy, holy, holy. They knew that. They knew that you couldn't pray or worship God if you were defiled. And so in their minds, you had to wash. Like that was their solution. Why don't your disciples wash their hands when they eat Jesus? Why don't you wash your hands, cleanse your hands? Like why don't you use the minimum amount of water? Like why don't you hold your fingertips up and down and then, and then scrub in the way you're supposed to scrub? In other words, they were saying, Jesus, you and your disciples are defiled. You're not doing what we're, we told you you're supposed to do. You claim to be the son of God. You claim to be the Messiah of God, but you're defiled. Well, notice that Jesus does not deny that he and his disciples didn't wash their hands. Instead, he boldly answers them in verse 3, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? In other words, you're passionate about your traditions. You're passionate about enforcing them. You're upset that what we what we're breaking your tradition, but you're breaking God's law. Verse four, God commanded, honor your father and mother. God commanded whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. Like it's that big of a deal. It's a capital offense. Jesus simply quoted two related and familiar commands. Like everyone, Jews all knew this was an honor shame culture. And this wasn't just like honor your parents, like give them a trophy or a medal or a picture or celebrate them on their birthday. No, this was specifically referring to honoring them in their later life. They didn't have Medicare, Social Security. And so the Jews were, were just understood that they were to care for, financially provide for their parents in their old age. 
That's what Jesus is referring to. Like it would be a capital offense. And they were all familiar with those commands of God from God's law. But in that context, they had instituted a loophole called Korban. Just like taxes with deductions and exceptions and alternatives, with Korban instituted, God never said anything about Korban, but the scribes and the Pharisees instituted this loophole in their explanation and application of what God had commanded. And specifically with Korban, if someone claimed their wealth, their property, their bank account, in essence, was Korban, it was legally dedicated to God. That's what verse 5 is referring to. Anyone could simply say, it's given to God. My wealth, my home, my bank account, it's given to God. It's Korriban. It belongs to God. All one had to say verbally, like you didn't have to write up a contract or or make a kind of uh, a deduction or donation. No, they would simply do so to shirk the responsibility of honoring their parents. They didn't want their burden. They were so self-centered. And the scribes and the Pharisees employed by the temple eventually benefited from that inheritance that would have been used up caring for, honoring for their parents. And so the scribes and the Pharisees said, yep, you're good. You're off the hook. You don't have to do what God commanded you to do. You don't have to honor your parents. You need not honor, verse 6, your father. And Jesus tells them, your traditions, your Korban tradition specifically, but Jesus is referring to much more than that. This is just an example. They contradict God's word. You think your traditions or loopholes can trump God's word, but God's word is truth. And traditions never trump truth. Can I get an amen? amen? And for that matter, now listen, we don't live. Now traditions can sometimes be good, but traditions never trump truth. Neither do your feelings. That might hit home here more. Because all the time I hear about people feel led, and even though it contradicts God's word, they feel, and they may feel deeply, they feel passionate about something, and it contradicts God's word, but their feelings in their minds make void the word of God. But let me understand, you need to understand, not only do traditions never trump truth, feelings never trump truth or perceptions. Like a lot of people have false perceptions and they might be passionate about what they perceive, but traditions, feelings, perceptions never trump truth. Truth is truth. Hear and understand. Jesus used these words. God is not going to lead you. I'm telling you right now, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's perfect in wisdom, perfect in knowledge, righteous in all his ways. He was righteous in all his ways. He is righteous in all his ways. He will be righteous in all his ways. Like he doesn't change his mind. Again, same yesterday, today, and forever. What was true is true. Truth is truth. Like where this plays out, and this might stab a little bit, divorce. I hear it. Marriage is on the brink of divorce and people feel strongly and say, even use the words, God is leading. I prayed about it. God's leading me to get a divorce. Listen, while there are in scripture, like places where it talks about when there are cases of adultery and infidelity and first Corinthians, listen, God hates divorce. Always. Abortion. Sex outside of marriage like any sex outside of a biblical marriage. But we love each other. We're going to get married. And listen, I don't mean to be sarcastic because it is a big deal. God hates sin. Sin is what defiles us. Sin is what separates us from him. Sin is why Jesus had to die. Sin is why Jesus' blood was shed. Sin separates us from the God who loves us, who is life. And so we cannot say or justify or make excuses like the Pharisees and the scribes. They use their traditions, but we use our feelings. No, truth is truth. Sin is sin. God is God and he is holy and righteous. We have a whole lot of people in our day, experts, right? Self-professed go-to guys who proclaim emphatically and give people license just like the scribes and the Pharisees. Oh yeah, you're off the hook. You don't have to honor your parents. Just say Korriban, like take care of that later. And that's the thing with Korriban. Like they could still enjoy the use of their property, of their money, still live in their house and not provide for their parents knowing that one day they were gonna eventually, when they died, give it to the temple. In addition to that, we have a lot of people feeling pretty validated in our day, claiming loopholes. 
when there is no loopholes. God doesn't work like the tax law of our day. There's no exemptions. There's no justifying. God is not okay with justifying. And there's no fine print either. Truth is truth. And the thing is, you can know it, right? John chapter 8, 32, this is what Jesus came to reveal. You can know the truth and the truth will set you free. His words are words of life. So first we see Jesus dispute a disingenuous delegation. Then we see Jesus denounce them, as in condemn them completely. The religious experts, right, in their religious regalia. I mean, they were the ones that prayed on the corners, right, that Jesus addressed in Matthew chapter 5, the wordy, eloquent, beautiful prayers. They were the one that gave alms in the temple. They gathered for worship and said, people, follow us. Do what we, if you want to get to know God, follow us. Jesus denounces them completely, fully disclosing their delusion of their doctrine and their definite demise. Verse seven, I love this. Jesus calls them right to their face. You hypocrites. The Pharisees and the scribes from Jerusalem, from headquarters, like the big dogs, right? The ones that they're, they were fake hypocrites. I don't need to explain what a hypocrite is, right? Phony frauds. They were not the real deal. I want to ask you this morning to consider your own faith. I don't ask you this to condemn you, but, but really, like, like there was a time in my life when I was a hypocrite. I don't, I don't want anyone to be a hypocrite. Are you a hypocrite? Jesus tells them and reminds them of when Isaiah confronted the people of God in his day and told them, the scribes and Pharisees of his day, that he was talking about you too, prophesying about you. In Isaiah, we see through the book of Isaiah that the people of God were doing all the right things. I mean, they were gathering, right? In Isaiah chapter one, they were all where they were supposed to be, doing what they were supposed to be doing. They were giving offerings, they were singing songs, making sacrifices, washing their hands, saying all the right things, doing what they felt they had to do, but God saw their hearts. He saw that they were just going through the motions for the sake of tradition. They didn't want to be there. They did not love God. Verse 8, they honored God with their lips in singing their songs, reciting their verses, but their hearts were far from him. They were hypocrites. God knew that so in Isaiah, he sent his prophet because he loved them. He wasn't okay with them being hypocrites of going through the motions. He wasn't about relationship or religion. He was about relationship. So he told them to repent. He warned them of the destruction and the demise that Jesus is warning the Pharisees and the scribes of. And this, Isaiah did the same thing. If they would not repent, if they didn't change their ways, the way they worshiped, Isaiah told them, stop religion. God doesn't need or want your offerings or your songs or your prayers. Not only does he not like them, he hates them. So stop doing them. What he wants you to do is repent. Come humbly before him and let him wash you. Let him cleanse you. Let him make you right, your heart right. They were hypocrites, the scribes and Pharisees of Jesus' day. Know that if we're not careful, we can fall into the same trap today. Some do and some have. And Jesus makes it clear in verse 9 that God is not okay with hypocrites. Jesus, one of the first things he says in John chapter 4, that God is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and truth. He's not about religion. He's about relationship. Consider your worship this morning. Jesus said and made it clear that their worship was not worship. It was in vain. They called it worship, but it wasn't worship. It did not please him. Verse 10, and he called the people to him and said to them, like aside, hear and understand. Like this is so important. Like, read my lips, look into my eyes. Jesus is communicating this. He says it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but referring to the Pharisees and the scribes, it's what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. Jesus was very clearly saying the problem is not with whether you wash your hands or not. The problem is not the outside. The problem is you don't get defiled by the outside. You're defiled. And we'll talk about that more in the moment, but Jesus fully discloses the utter delusion of their doctrine. And their definite demise. Verse 12, then the disciples came to Jesus. He says, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Like they're all worked out. These are the big dogs from Jerusalem, Jesus. These are the go-to guys. Like these are the enforcers, right? The spiritual police. Jesus, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? When they heard your preaching? Jesus, you're stirring them up. They're offended. They took offense. Brothers and sisters, many are offended in our day too, are they not? Not necessarily about what I say, but what Jesus says, what God says in his holy word. What is meant to make a way for us to know and have a relationship with him. I realize that some of what I preach offends, but that does not negate or make void my responsibility as a pastor called and commissioned by God to preach it. 
especially because of what lies in the balance that Jesus talks about here, heaven and hell. The thing is, how people feel about truth does not change the truth at all. You've heard the, the illustration that if a house is burning down and you yell to the people, come out of the house, the house is burning down. It doesn't matter whether or not they believe that the house is burning down. The house is burning down. Their offense does not change the reality one iota. Jesus made it clear, verse 13, that these self-appointed go-to religious guys were not what they claimed to be. Even though they might have been sincere and passionate, ignorant, one can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. It does not change what is right. Jesus answered in verse 13, the truth is, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. I believe this, if you're, again, this is the beauty of preaching verse by verse. Like just a couple sermons ago, Matthew chapter 13, we saw the parable of the weeds, or, or some call it the wheat and the tares, where, where Jesus says that a man planted seed in his field, and that when his men were sleeping, the enemy came and planted weeds among them. In the parable, the weeds were finally dealt with when it was time for harvest. Remember what happened to them? They were gathered and burned. The wheat was gathered into the barn. The weeds were gathered and burned. And the parable, the weeds symbolized, Jesus explained this. The weeds symbolized people among the true people of God who may look the part but are fakes. And when all is said and done, Jesus says in Matthew 13, 41, the son of man will send his angels and they will gather out his, of his kingdom all causes of sin, all lawbreakers, that is not tradition breakers, breakers of God's law and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said it, not me. That's referring to hell. Like the farmer in the parable, Jesus says in verse 14, let them alone. They are blind guides, and if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. And again, I believe even the pit is an illusion pointing forward to hell. Hear and understand. False teachers and those who follow them will fall. Who are you following? Who are you listening to, giving ear to? Maybe you're leading, like maybe you're doing a lot of talking. Maybe you're presenting yourself as an expert, proclaiming traditions, feelings, emotions. Maybe you are leading. Where are you taking them? Are you a blind guide? Broad is the road, Jesus says, that leads to destruction. But narrow is the road that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Which road are you on? Follow Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Come unto Jesus. He is salvation. He is the bridge. Those who belong to him and thereby are truly a part of his con kingdom. In contrast, if you remember the parable of the wheat and the weeds, the plants that will be rooted up and thrown into hell and burned, the wheat will be gathered into the barn, not to be burned, but instead, Matthew 13, 43, they will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Follow Jesus, listen to Jesus, hear and understand what Jesus says. So again, first point, Jesus boldly disputes a disingenuous delegation. Secondly, he denounces their doctrine completely, pointing forward to their utter demise. And last, we see Jesus diagnose the true dilemma of man's defilement. In other words, he gets to the heart of the matter, which is our heart, not our hands, brothers and sisters. Peter said to him, verse 15, explain the parable to us. And Jesus, almost in a frustrated manner, are you still without understanding, Peter? Like, listen to me, look into my eyes, read my lips. Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? right? <laughs> but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. This defiles a person. This aligns with what Jesus says, right? In Luke chapter 6, verse 45, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, our sinfulness, our defilement, our problem before a holy, righteous God is not a reflection of what we eat or how many times we wash our hands or take showers for that matter. The solution is not some outward display. The solution is Jesus, the blood of Jesus. Like we sang in the first song this morning, what can wash away my sins? What can cleanse me? What can purify me so that I can stand before a holy, righteous God? I know and understand that I'm defiled. I've tried to clean up my act, but I can't be perfect. I fall short of the, the standard. Jesus is the standard. Standard. He is the righteousness. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What can wash away our sins, cleanse us so that we can know him, have a relationship with him? The blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on Calvary. What we do and say our sin and defilement for holy righteous God at its core is a hard problem. Our hearts are the heart of the matter. We are called to purity. Yes, we are called to holiness. God hates sin. Yes. His standard is righteousness that can only be 
imputed to us by Jesus. Jeremiah 17, so we bring it to a close. Listen, if you don't know your heart, ask God to show you, to reveal to you your sin and sinfulness. This is what God did in bringing me to my salvation. I had done the church thing. I had sung the songs. I had quoted the verses, right? Looked the part, hair parted to the side. I mean, the golden child, the poster boy for, for American Christianity. But I was lost. And God, in his grace, revealed to me my utter depravity, my desperate need for him, even with my hair parted to the side. Like out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. The heart is deceitful. Jeremiah 17, 9, above all things, it's desperately sick. Who can understand it? The problem is the Lord doesn't look on outward appearance. The Lord looks on, looks on the heart. He sees the heart. Jesus is saying the problem is not whether or not you wash your hands before you eat. We do need to be pure, right? Baptism tonight. People aren't saved, like considered righteous for God if they get baptized, immersed, and we believe by baptism, by immersion. But what baptism is to us is a way for us to profess the reality that is in our heart. It is an outward expression of an inward reality. Like, I believe, like, I'm all in the kingdom. Like, this is what I believe. My sins have been washed away, not by the water in the bath, but it's symbol, symbolized by the blood that has washed away their sins. So all the things that they, that they were separated by God because of have been dealt with. This is why we celebrate. We can be pure. God promised us new hearts as we, as we close. Even from the beginning, Ezekiel chapter 36, 25. God promised, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Consider the state of your heart. Consider your worship, the state of your heart. Examine your heart today. Is it pure? Is it washed? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Listen, the blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient to wash away all sin. In that passage, Paul writes to the church and he reminds the church members of their former lives and the sins that they have engaged in. And he lists all kinds, very similar to the sins listed in here by Jesus. And he said, listen, don't be like that. Don't act like that anymore. Such were some of you. Some of you engaged in those types of vile sins, that kind of sinfulness, but you were washed, you were cleansed. Everything that needed to take place, everything that needed to happen so that you could have a relationship with God was taken care of when Christ died on the cross. When you believed and Place your faith and trust in him. So be who he created you to be. Live out your life as one whose sins have been washed away. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And worship him in spirit and in truth. Let's bow our heads and pray and respond. Father God, spirit of God, would you move today? When we worship you here at Lifehouse Truth, we want to worship you in spirit and in truth. We don't want to go through the motions, checking boxes, thinking that we have to do things a certain way. No, what you're interested in is our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would protect us from the fallacy of elevating traditions or feeling or perceptions over the truth that you communicate in your word. Help us to live by and walk by your holy word. To celebrate it, to proclaim it, to preach it, and to receive it, even when it may offend us. God, may we not be like the scribes and the Pharisees who took offense and that became a stumbling block and hindered them from being saved. God, I pray if there's someone here who's been clinging to offense and needs to surrender that offense this morning. God, I pray that you'd give them the faith to do that. Help them to know and understand that you preach the truth because you want them, you want better for them. You want life for them, freedom and salvation. Lord, help us to understand and know what lies in the balance. And in light of that, not sugarcoat anything as your people or think that there's loopholes or excuses or make justifications. Help us to be obedient. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us be grateful. 
Lord, fill our hearts with gratitude by your spirit as we think about what you've done for us. You did what no one else could do. No amount of showers or hand washings or rules or regulations could do for us, Jesus, what you did for us when you died on the cross. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. You shed your blood so that our sins could be washed away and so that we who are defiled can be considered righteous before you. Lord, create in us clean hearts, pure hearts, sincere hearts for your glory. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today and God is stirring your heart in some way, maybe you've been clinging to a tradition or perception, justifying disobedience and sin in your life because of how passionate you feel about something, even though it disagrees with what God clearly communicates in his word. My prayer is that I'll give you faith to obey him. He'll help you. Remember, he's with us always, even to the end of the age. Surrender to him. Submit to him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Repent this morning if need be. If you're here today with heads bowed and eyes closed and you've not yet had a relationship or, or entered into a relationship with God through Jesus, I invite you to today. In the Bible, it says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that word everyone in the Bible means everyone. No matter who you are, no matter how defiled you understand and know that you are, the blood of Christ is sufficient. You need only believe. Repent of your sins and believe. Turn from them and to the Lord Jesus Christ to save you. If that's you, I invite you to pray this prayer with me right where you're seated. Say, Jesus, I need you. Please, right now, as I repent and turn to you, expressing my faith in you, please forgive my sins and save me. And show me from this point forward where to go, what to do, how to live for your glory. I want to worship you in spirit and in truth. I want to know you. Please save me. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if that's you, if you prayed that prayer sincerely and genuinely, listen, God hears your heart, sees your heart, and hears your heart. So if that's you, would you be so bold enough to just express and testify, Mark, that's me. I prayed that prayer just now, calling upon the name of Jesus for salvation. I've turned, repented from my sins, and turned to Jesus this morning. Is there anyone here who would testify of that? Man, I see your hand in the back. Listen, I don't want to embarrass anyone. I just want to rejoice. This is an incredible work that only God can do. And we love to see him do that. So if you're here and he did that for you this morning, simply just raise your hand to testify. Anyone else? Amen. You can put your hands down. Church, let's stand and respond and sing. Again, not just words going through the motions, but from our hearts, let's worship the Lord. Let's mean what we sing, express what we feel. It's a powerful thing. It's worship. The altar's open. I encourage you to come.